everyone it's such a joy to be with you this afternoon uh, my name is Alison and yes I'm a member of Hall Council at Wycliffe as a facilitator and coach um, and I also hold a number of trustee positions so leadership is very dear to my heart um, and I would really love to introduce to you uh, Finney uh, if you're able to put your camera on and um, introduce to you Dr Finney Philip who is the principal of Philadelphia Bible College in northern India where he is joining us from today and Finney also is uh, works with growing churches in in northern India. Hello Finney. Hello, hello Alison, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, also I'd like to introduce to you Justin Terry, the author of the book that we're going to be talking about today. Hi Justin. Hello, good to be with you, thank you Alison. Justin's you, joining from Justin's joining us from um, Oxford and he is the Vice Principal of Wycliffe Hall. Uh, it's a huge uh, privilege to uh, be hosting this conversation and I really want it to be a conversation so I really look forward to your questions on the Q&A so please do start um, writing anything that you want to ask Justin or Finney and put them in there. I've got some questions to start with but I would really love um, this to be a conversation between all of us on the webinar this afternoon. So just to start, uh, Justin, um, it's a great book. I really enjoyed reading it, but but why did you why did you decide to write a book? It's quite a you've got quite a lot in your life already. Why why write a book on top of everything else? Well thank you for the question. I think initially it was in the first edition to prepare people about to go out and lead a church. So I'd just been doing that in London. By this point I was out in Pittsburgh at a theological college or seminary or Bible college. And I was asked to talk to the students who are heading towards church leadership, tell them basically what they need to know to be a church leader. Well, I found that quite hard going. Uh, thankfully, I had a chance to do it again the following year and the year after. And as I did so, I began to think, I think there are five phases. There are this, first, you've got to develop trust before you can do very much. You've got to then be cultivating leaders, you've got to be then discerning vision, got to implement plans, and you've got to know when you're finished and how to transition out. So I began to realize those things. And then I noticed as I had these ideas getting clearer, it's not just good for people before they start leading, it's actually quite helpful to know when you're leading so you can kind of see where you are. And then uh, the Langham Publishing put me in touch with Finney Phillip, who helped me get a much wider vision of the international leaders and leadership. And so through his role in particular and talking to people in uh, many other different countries, but particularly Finney, hopefully it's now got a sort of more international feel to it. And that's made it really exciting in this sort of revised version that we're talking about today. Mm, thank you, Justin. Finney, tell, tell me about um, when you first read the book, when you were first in touch with Justin, what was it that inspired you? What was it that grabbed your imagination? Thank you, Alison, and also Justin, thank you uh, for that introduction. Uh, I think in 2017 or so, our dear friend, Peter Kwan sent me a PDF of his book and asked me to have a look at it. And at the first sight itself, I thought that is quite different from the normal stuff that we get, uh, the management tips or the strategies that are ready made available for leading. And always uh, I had, I mean, I'm not so much connected with those kinds of stuff. What this, this title really attracted me it's a life cycle of a, of a leader. That's what I am familiar with. And God has called you to ministry as full time in that sense. And very much biblical at the same time. Um, the stories and the narratives emerges out of Justin's life in a church. And that was crucial. But then later we had the conversation together last uh, Year or, um, a year ago, I had the privilege of being at Justin's house and I could really see him live what he preached or wrote in the book. So that is exciting. And I believe that this has great uh, value for global church and leadership. Mm, thank you, Finney. And um, just for, for those of you who haven't read the book yet, and I, I do recommend it to, to all of you and, and Matthew might pop in the chat or I think it's on an email, how you can buy a copy. Um, but anyway, the book starts um, by saying leadership matters and it matters a lot. Um, and I know that's true in my own life. I know that it matters a lot there, but I just wondered whether each of you could give an example 
of where leadership has mattered in your life, whether that's an inspirational leader that you've worked with or who has inspired you or, or, or a situation that you've been, just, just where you've seen leadership matter a lot. Um, Justin, do you, want, do you want to start and then I'll come to Finney? Yeah, well, I, I do think I've seen a number of men and women who are just exceptional leaders in the world of education, uh, in the business world, and in the church. Um, but to pick one really inspirational leader, I think I'd pick uh, Bishop Richard Chartres. Uh, I, I was serving under him when he was Bishop of London, and it was a very inspiring environment. We were aware that when he first took over, it was quite a challenging time. Hearing the stories of how he'd been asked right early on by different committees uh, who'd been doing work on the local churches in the city of London, right in the sort of financial district, and he was being asked to close them down. And he said, if we close them down, we'll never open them up again. And he was able to find a way of getting them all kind of revitalized. And then he put a vision together for the, and a sort of strategy together for the diocese. We're on a foot footing of growth and advance. And then he had these marvelous ways of being willing to use his influence to bring about change and get plans operating. But also, frankly, that more sort of individual touch. I first met him, I think, 1990, when I was trying to work out if I should think about ordination in the Church of England. And at the time, he was in the role of a director of ordinance, which, again, people not in the Anglican world, is basically someone who's cultivating leaders uh, for the Church of England. And uh, so I met him then. Well, he still knows my name, my wife's name. He knows everywhere I've served. I think he remembers every conversation I've ever had that lovely sense of personal trust and relationship. So I've always found him a deeply inspirational leader. And I suppose I've got to name one person. I'd name Bishop Richard Chartres. Oh, thank you, Justin. That is um, that is really inspiring. And I must say, I have always enjoyed my um, interactions with um, Bishop Richard whenever I've met him, or Lord Chartres, as he is now, I think. Um, yes. Finney, um, do, you have a, do you have some stories or some inspiration for us? Yes, Alison, and the Lord has blessed me with a lot of inspirational leaders around me, even from my Sunday school teacher to mm -hmm. Uncle John. And so that's the range of uh, leadership, uh, friendship, inspirational leaders I have experience with. But I would like to pick up one leader from India, which is who is also the founder of the ministry that I am at the moment uh, uh, part of, uh, is, is, is uh, Dr. Thomas Matthews. And Matthews has an outstanding leadership qualities and I can list a lot of features or aspects of his leadership. But two things I just want to highlight. One is that he's close enough to share my heart towards him and he can directly speak to me. But at the same time, he will distance you or push you to the end in order to fulfill a common vision. So I've been thrown into situations of mission context, administrative setups, challenges, and all kinds of things. And I, and I, I could see that transparency within him that really helped me to see him as an inspirational leader. The second thing is that one thing I observed with him is that um, although he's known, he never focused his leadership on events or programs or things that attracts attraction to him. Rather, he put his efforts on empowerment. I'm, I'm just thinking about one incident where a young person was mentored unto him many years ago. He sent him for theological studies. And when he completed and graduated and came back to him, during that time, Dr. Matthews had only his bicycle to travel. And just a month ago, before that, somebody um, gifted him a scooter. And when this young man came, he gave the key of the scooter and said to him, take this, you can do much better than me. I still can use my bicycle. This is empowerment. This is leadership. And I grew uh, in that context. Wow, that's such a great story, Finney. Thank you. I shall remember that, actually. Just who can we give the keys of the scooter to? Maybe Justin and I, when we're at Hall Council, we can we can refer to that. Like, who should we be giving the keys of the scooter to? Maybe some of you can then remember that story as well and uh, think of ways to apply that in your lives. Um, folks, I haven't had many questions, and I would love some questions to ask uh, Justin and Finney. So, 
Uh, you need, if you look at the bottom bar of your screen, you'll see on the far right, um, Q and A. Or if it's not in the bottom, it might be at the top, but look for where it says Q and A. And if you click there, and uh, then you can um, write a question in there. And we would really love to have your questions um, to ask. Justin and Finney, I'd love this to be a conversation that we can all join in together. So um, if there's something that they're talking about that you want to know more about, or if we're not talking about the things you're interested in, please write a question and then we'd I'd be really happy to ask that on your behalf. Um, the, the book begins, Justin, um, the, one of the very um, early um, chapters, it talks about establishing trust. And I, I really like that. Um, I'm, I'm very, um, I find the work by um, Patrick Lencioni very useful. And a number of you may be aware of that, where he, he talks about team and, and trust being the foundation of good teamwork. And I think it's really interesting in your book about leadership, you've also started with establishing trust. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I wonder if you can just talk a bit more, Justin, about how do you do that? What does establishing trust look like practically? If you could just um, unpack that a little bit for us. Um, it makes sense, but how, how do we do that? I think to me, it's, it's trying to make that personal connection with people that you have responsibility for leading. So if you get a chance to take time with them one to one, I love having meals with people or having coffee with people, especially when you first meet them, obviously not the very moment you meet perhaps, uh, <laughs> but I was a vicar of quite a small church and we were literally next door in the vicarage. My wife would always cook more food than we needed for Sunday lunch. And it wouldn't be unusual to be able to say to somebody, well, do you want to come and have lunch with us? And those sort of moments over a meal table hospitality, you can build really deep relationships. So after that, you've got something to build on. So I do think it's a matter of spending time with people individually. I think it's also a matter of trying never to promise something you can't deliver. It's, it's easy in the heat of the moment to say, oh, I'll get back to you about that, or I'll send you one of those. And people notice when you don't, especially if you're in a leadership role. So you, know, you want to uh, under promise and over deliver, to hear the, use a phrase I heard more recently. And I think that is really significant uh, because it may seem like a minor commitment, but in fact, it's a commitment. And Trying to build trust is often about following through on something you, you said you'd do. And also, frankly, to be uh, honest when you've made a mistake. Oh, I shouldn't have said that, or I shouldn't have done that. And again, people might be afraid that that's going to undermine your leadership. Well, obviously, it would have been better if you hadn't made the mistake, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but once you've made it, say, you know, I made it, I made a mistake, and I'm sorry about that. Try to learn from it, move on. That builds trust rather than trying to cover it up, pretend you didn't get it wrong. So I do think. Those things, um, I think, really can help to, to build trust with people. Yeah, I, I think that's really helpful. And you've reminded me of a model of trust that I sometimes use at work um, and which talks about the different components that make up trust. And one of them is reliability. So doing what you say you're going to do. One of them is openness. So exactly, you know, fessing up when you've messed up. Um, and, um, uh, and one of them actually is acceptance. So I wondered if you have any thoughts about acceptance, Justin, and, and I think what that means is accepting people as they are and um, yeah, just not, not judging them. What, just, I wonder what you think about that. Well, I think this, I mean, I'm naturally a curious person. I love getting to know people. So th th this is no, no challenge for me, it's a delight. So having a chance to find out about people, what makes them tick? And it's not to evaluate them, it's a journey when you get to know them and try to form a bond of friendship. And I think, to my mind, that's one of the great joys of leadership. And I do think, as you're doing that, you're building trust, you're building relationships. And I think it is about trying to connect with people where they are and to think about where are they coming from? What matters to them? And if there's something that comes up, you think, well, someone say will be very interested in that. Try to make the connection, send them an email. Uh, maybe there's a book you hear about and think, well, I know someone who's going to be interested in that book. And try to take that moment. It may only take a few minutes to send them an email. I think those things build up a really deep relationship and build the trust that leaders need. Mm, thank you. Finney, I'd love to hear your thoughts about building relationship, building trust. And it's interesting, isn't it, that actually most of the things that we've talked about so far, here we are, you know, um, just coming up to quarter of an hour into our call. And actually, we've spent a lot of time talking about relationships. You talked about Richard Charters and how good he was at building relationship. Finney, you talked about 
um, Thomas Matthews and how he was just really good at building those relationships and empowering other people. So I'd, I'd love your thoughts on, on trust and relationships, Vinny. Well, I would like to quote from the book that the leadership is achievement of trust. And, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a fantastic, it need to be, um, you know, explained in, in a deeper level, but I, you know, just holding there. Normally uh, in the management circles, um, you, uh, you build up your trust within contractual agreements. That's the normal. If you follow this, my trust is built within the agreements. But in our circles, it's much more of a covenant relationship that builds trust around. That's why fruit of the spirit comes very good as uh, Justin describes it here. I think because of that broader framework that we have, failures, second chance, more opportunities, care for one another, and lifting up people who are down, all these are possible to build up trust. One of the key things that's uh, maybe unique to Global South is that element of communality, in the sense that we live together and then see the leaders grow. And most of the great leaders that we have in our mission fields, all of them lived here in our campus, which is a very small campus. We get up at 5.30, we pray together, we eat together, we know each of the student who is studying here. And this development, this trust that's been built while they are here, living together and understanding the nature and to build the character, it's a long time, long time thing. That's why our students stay back, our graduates stay back and go to the mission fields and work. I think communal living, uh, that's, a, that's a very important aspect to build trust because they see, they see you in your life situation. I guess for some of us who are not called to, um, uh, are not called to, to um, to, to that, to living in a community. I'm thinking of myself and maybe some other people on the call who are called to other things, called to not um, work in a, in, a, in a church setting or, or to do paid Christian work. Um, I'd love your thoughts on that. And actually there's a question from Paul um, as well, which says, uh, do you see Christian leadership different to secular leadership? And I guess um, that is particularly for those of us who spend some of our week not in a in a church or in a Christian setting, but um, out um, in uh, in our communities or in in business or whatever it is that uh, God's called us to do. Justin, thoughts about that? Christian leadership is that the same or different? To say I think the same five phases are true in both. Mm. Um, so I think you still have to develop trust. You still need mm. to cultivate leaders. You need to turn the vision. You need to implement the plans. You need to know when you're finished and time to move on. So I think that all still works. And I think if you're a Christian in those different roles, yeah. I hope you're still praying. I hope you're still seeking the godliness um, that Jesus came to make possible for us. And you've got the Holy Spirit at work in you. But clearly, you can't really open meetings by saying, well, let's all say a prayer together. Uh, that's, you know, lovely to be able to do in a Christian context, as I can where I am now and in previous roles. So I think that's the challenge. How do you still live out your Christian vocation, you know, if you're coming from a Christian perspective, in the non, if not specifically Christian context. So I think you still want to be living a godly Christian life, but realizing you can't expect others to join in with the prayers. Uh, so you've got to pray privately uh, and pray for people. Uh, and obviously you've got to be very respectful of the culture that you're in and not people put people in a different difficult position because when you're in leadership, you've got influence and we don't want to use that influence wrongly, but we do need to be ready to give a witness when we get invited to do so. Yeah, and I, I think I think that's right. And I, I really like what Finney said. And I think that for those of us, for, for me and others who um, are not living in a community, we still have the opportunity to build community and to offer hospitality and to do that. So actually one of the things I know for myself is um, with my um, the, the people that I pray with regularly and study with regularly, actually, it's just a whole lot better if we eat together first. That's what I've um, discovered, which is what you're saying in, in, a, in a microcosm, isn't it, Finney? We, we may not be living in the same place, but if we can invite each other in and eat together and share a little bit more than just, well, not, not just, but, um, but, but just share a little bit more life as well as praying and reading the Bible together, that does seem to help. Would you agree with that, Finney? Oh, definitely. I think that's, that's key and that's 
what we think as our blessings of the Lord that's on us to have that kind of environment. I'm just thinking about the situations of mission travels and uh, there are incidents where we don't have enough finance to purchase enough food to the mm. team. And there were stories that I've heard about leaders who would buy one samosa or one bread and then they will share. And may they have only enough money to have one cup of tea, but then they will buy one cup of tea and then share with them. And that shows a transparency. There is a trust being built up to the people around you saying that, look, this is a different kind of leadership. We can do things together because we are sharing things together. Mm. Thank you. I think that's, for me, that's really inspiring. Actually, how do I do that? How do I build community? How do I share generously? How do I give the keys of the scooter to someone else? That's actually trust and community that we can all be involved in building. And um, Stephanie, I know, is um, with a, num a group of other people. She put that in the chat. Hi, Stephanie, and all the people that you're with. And um, she says, I've recently been studying Enneagram. Um, and she says, we all know about Myers-Briggs. I'm not sure if everyone will know about Myers-Briggs, but it's a, it's a type of personality um, psychometric test. It's a, site, a tool to help us understand ourselves and other people better. And there's something called Strength Finders as well. Um, and she asks, do you think that certain personality types are better suited to lead than others? That's, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I think there has been some evidence that it helps if you're more extroverted, but you haven't got to be an extrovert because you can make yourself more extroverted. So there's a certain amount of complexity in here, and I'm not claiming to be an expert on these things. <laughs> so I do think there are some people for whom certain elements of leadership come more naturally. Uh, but I'd be surprised if there's certain kinds of you know groupings under the sort of Myers-Briggs or Enneagram who couldn't be a leader. I suspect some elements of the leadership role will come easier than others. So it is a matter, I think, of trying to recognize where your own calling and gifts are, things that come easier, marvelous, things where you find a struggle, you might either be able to develop those gifts yourself or work alongside people who have those particular skills. So I, I don't, I wouldn't imagine there are certain people who are unsuited to leadership, but I suspect all of us have got to work on the things that don't come so naturally to us. I think it's interesting as well, isn't it, in the Bible that actually some of the people who were called to be leaders were not the people who we might expect to be called leaders, or maybe the people who, you know, and, and we, we find that, um, that Moses really didn't want to be that person, did he? And he really felt that actually other people, someone else might be better. I mean, and I'm just trying to think who else, but I know that it, actually the Bible's full of stories of people who perhaps weren't obvious leaders, but God chose them and called them. And so I suppose, as I think about that question, Stephanie, I think, well, actually, it's probably more about God's call on our lives um, because God uses each person and has made us for particular situations. Finney, what, what are your reflections on that? 100%, I agree with that in the sense that the personalities or the qualities that God has put in, in our heart is to bring together, that's the nature of the church. It is a building together. No, we, we all have the same kind of leadership personalities within a community. You will end up in lots of trouble. Um, so personally, I'm not a very person with a lot of words or gift of gaps for me, but I sort of bless me with uh, long-term thinking, sharpening of various aspect of ministry, which is a benefit for the ministry at large here. So I feel it plays and a role, whether your personality may be different, but there is a role. I think that's the beauty of the church. I think that's what we need to celebrate together. Mm, I, I think that's, that's great. I hope that answers your question, Stephanie. I think that leaders come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, myself, that's been my experience. Um, Robert, hello, Robert. So I'll answer a question to Robert Magula. Thank you. Um, he says uh, that we're speaking about some very profound things, which is, is true, and he leads a parish. He says the church in America is going through much turmoil nowadays. Um, how can I lead my parish in a manner that honours God and fulfils the needs? That's a, that's a big question. We could spend the whole afternoon. So really, how can he lead his parish? Um, any, I think it'd be good to encourage Robert. Robert, I'm sure that um, 
God's called you to that work and I'm sure that he will help you with this. Thanks for your question. Justin, how can we encourage Robert? Yeah, well, firstly, it's good that you're willing to share these things and we can be praying for each other because leadership is rarely easy. And I think the sort of post-COVID world is a particularly difficult one. All sorts of financial challenges and sort of rebuilding of community, lots of other big issues uh, around us. One of the key things, which I kind of just, I stumbled upon when I was vicar at St. Helens, North Kensington, but actually found out the terminology for when I was in America at Pittsburgh, um, is this sense of being a non-anxious presence. Uh, you probably know about these things. It's a, a whole sort of theory of uh, kind of a counselling theory, really, family systems. Um, so one of the key things, though, is for the leader to try to remain a non-anxious presence in the middle of even troubling, anxious making times. So seeking the peace of the Lord that passes all understanding is itself a great help to the leadership role. If you start getting into a panic, it's like a like an aeroplane pilot, the minute you hit turbulence, if you start panicking and making you know, alarming noises over the tannoy, that's not gonna help. So you're gonna somehow, so I shouldn't talk about flights at the moment because we can't fly, it only adds insult to injury. But the, the point here is, if we're able to remain calm, prayerful, peaceful, trusting in God's provision in the middle of a crisis, that is itself a real help. So staying close to the Lord, drawing on his peace through his Holy Spirit. But I do think also is having that longer term vision, a sense of where do you think you, where do you think the Lord's taking you? A sense of purpose. What are we supposed to be doing here? Or what are the values that are holding us? You know, what do we hold dear here? So those sort of things, I think, really can help in uncertain times. Hold on to those things that you think the Lord has already given you. And I think that can help you go through the turbulence that many of us are experiencing at the moment. Mm. Wow, we've got lots of questions. Um... Finney and Justin. So I'm going to just move us on, actually. And Finney, maybe you can talk about this, because I know that um, India has been very badly affected by COVID and, and, and some of the turbulence and difficulty that many of us have faced this past year has been to do with that. Um, and so Samuel asks, do you have any advice on leadership in today's COVID affected world, particularly thinking about working online? Um, Finney, I'd, I'd love uh, that. And I'd love if you would just share a little bit about how things are with your churches, um, the churches you're involved in in Northern India. Thanks. Yes, Alison, I think uh, there's the same situation here too. We are not able to meet uh, physically, but most of the meetings that we do by online or Zoom calls. Uh, one of the helpful thing that we are trying to do is to engage people in smaller groups in trying to develop our uh, leaders, leaders, multiple leaders to gather together and work with smaller groups and uh, spend a lot of time in prayer at the same time encouraging and motivating words to do. That's one thing we try to do. The other thing which was really helpful for me is that recently I've been started conversation with leaders of similar situations where they have the fear about ministry. Some of them have lost the confidence about leading the church. We started, uh, um, con uh, you know, started the conversation with them and then started looking at uh, particularly the book of Acts and the kind of crisis that the early church went through and the kind of leadership that emerged out of it has become a great source for us to be encouraged from the word of God. So uh, this fellowship with um, men and women who are uh, doing the ministry but lost the confidence but then brought us together regaining the strength to continue the work so uh, these are two things which I just want to share. Mm, thank you Finney that's great. Um, we've got a couple of questions about uh, when things are not working so well and um, I think all of us have been in those situations and I'm, I'm sure we could spend the, the whole time talking about when things don't go so well. So Brandon asks, what key components would you encourage to focus on um, when um, a team or people in a team have very different views um, on life? So when there's a difference and um, there's another question, hold on just a second, this if I can find it um, here, um, just about resolving um, uh, conflict. Shady asks, um, a crucial component of leadership is conflict resolution. How do you go about this? So this is, I think is really about, I mean, great if your team's good, you've built trust, everyone's empowered, you're moving forwards with the vision, but when it's not going so well, well what advice do you have, um, Justin? 
these are again great questions and um I must say in the revised edition of this book, I've written a bit more about these things because on the first edition, people said, please write more about these things. So I have had to do more homework on these various subjects and included them in, in the book. So I think the first thing, when you've got a team of people uh, who are not getting along well, again, it's not unknown, um, to spend time with individuals so that they know they're being heard and being respected and their views are being considered and taken seriously. Uh, and one of the things, again, I do mention in the book actually, is a sense of the different stages of leadership and formation of a group. The fact there is a chaos phase that groups generally go through, especially when they're new or when new people come in. I was quite, I find that very helpful because there've been a number of times when I've seen groups kind of not doing very well. And I couldn't initially see why. And then I thought, well, they're just going through the chaos phase. Um, but you do get to the point that, in Shady's question about what, how do you actually resolve a conflict? Uh, and again, obviously, these things come in different shapes and forms. Sometimes at sort of a lower level of conflict, you can just say, look, can, can the two of you please meet and see if you can resolve it? And a sort of Matthew 18 versus 19 and 20 kind of approach. Please see if you can just work it out together. Um, but quite frequently, if it's coming to you, they've tried that and it hasn't, it hasn't worked. So it may be you've got to see if the two would agree to sit together with you or some other mediator and each of them gets a chance to speak and say, well, Here's what I'm thinking, and this is why I feel passionately about it, and better say what they want to say without the other person in interrupting. And then I did get the other person to kind of, you know, summarize, reflect back what they've heard. And then that other person gets a chance to say, well, this is what I'm seeing. This, this is what I'm feeling. And the other person has to, again, listen quietly through that, summarize what they've heard, make sure that they can kind of really know that they've heard each other. And in that kind of process, which frankly is difficult, I've been involved with it several times, some people say, I just don't want to do it. And I, I understand that. But if you are willing to do it, I have seen that work quite a number of times. And again, if it's a Christian context, you can pray together. You can hold the thing up to God in prayer, pray together at the end. But try to see if out of that, you can work out things to do differently in the future. Could we agree to do X? You know, maybe next time this happens, we'll do Y. So some fairly practical outcomes, I think, uh, can really be helpful to building up trust and dealing with a conflict which does arise in any yeah. organization. Yeah, but I'm sure in India, they never, they don't have any disagreements in India, I'm sure. I'm sure Finney doesn't have any experience of this. <laughs> it's only in Oxford, Justin. Only in Oxford, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just two hours ago, <laughs> I had a very similar situation. A conflict has emerged among a network of leaders. And uh, we were really surprised at the way it came out. <laughs> and then what happened was, um, we just kept quiet, although in leadership, but we picked up the phone and called those people who were feeling uneasy about the way things are and talked to them. And in 10 minutes time, that particular conflict just resolved. And, and so what, Justin just mentioned, that's the kind of thing that we need to go down, you know, like, or go to them and to speak, open our hearts and find out what exactly is the issue. And so I, I would uh, very much agree and it's very much true in India and maybe in South Asia, this is uh, it's, it's there. <laughs> I lost a little bit of that at the end, Finney, but I think we, we caught it really. And I think it's interesting how a lot of our conversations coming back to relationships, isn't it really, actually, and, and building relationships and just taking time to allow people to be heard. And Paul um, is writing to us from the Gower Peninsula, which is in Wales, for those of you who don't know where that is. Um, so that's on, in the west of the United Kingdom. Um, and also um, there's a similar question as well from William. He doesn't say where he is, Masakoi. Um, let me read Paul's question to you. He finds himself leading a small chapel in a thinly populated area and the culture is not very open to hospitality and they're really used to a pulpit only ministry. Um, and then William's question is, how do you build trust with people who reject your vision and leadership, particularly in the local church context? So where you're coming with one vision of how you want to lead the church and the church is wanting something else. I'm sensing from, from Paul that he would love them, you know, to have to be more open, more hospitable, to have a different sort of experience. And um, 
So just just advice uh, for the for those two questions, which is it's similar to the conflict, but perhaps a little bit different because it's really about um, where you as a leader find that your um, what you want to do is not quite what the people you're leading want to do. How do you how do you manage that? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a tough spot. That's a tough spot. Um, so it particularly if it's hard to form those sort of relationships through meals, maybe not even, I mean, if you can get at least a coffee after the service or a tea after the service, even that can be really quite helpful in terms of building relationships. So I'd still want to say, is there some way you can build up relationships there to make more of a personal connection, build the trust? Um, so, I mean, basically it could be that it's just a matter of trying to be persistent and going on, uh, sharing the vision and, and seeking to bring people on board. Uh, there are famous stories, Charles Simeon's amazing story of, of doing the ministry in Cambridge, the struggles he had, years of rejection before he had an amazingly effective ministry. So it may be persistence, uh, but again, you want to be in touch with the, those who are your mentors, your leaders in that particular context and just keep checking, am I in the right place? That's the other half of this. Again, it's an uncomfortable thing to have to think about. Um, but if you've been in a place for a long time and there's still resistance to, to the vision uh, and there's nothing you can do to kind of shift that, I think it's at least a question to be asked um, because um, there, it, it, after a long time of trying to share a vision, drawing people into it, um, then there may be a time you think, well, am I in the right place? So again, that's something you have to discern with others. We don't want to give up quickly, um, but I think that's at least a question that maybe you want to be at least raising and trying to think through with people. Finney, what's your experience of that? Um, you personally, or I know that you helped to lead a number of different churches or working with leaders in Northern India. Um, I'm sure you've seen situations like this many times. How, how, what's your wisdom? We'd love to hear. Yeah, I, you know, um, the first thing that came to my mind was to read the book, you know, in the sense that <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of things have been, uh, you know, very from a very practical level in which uh, just to put things together. I remember an incident in the way that how the Lord led this ministry to a, a, a greater level. The great growth happened only after about, you know, about 15 years or so uh, after founding uh, a, a local church. It's been a very hard time. So with all these practical ways of perseverance and all those things, we need to depend on God and his Holy Spirit to, to open the moment uh, for him to work. And so that is the example I can bring. Uh, into answering that question. Complete trust in God uh, and uh, waiting for God. And this wait for so long, the church that we had here was very small, but then the, uh, they were praying, you know, we have the practice of fasting and prayer in the church. So one of the uh, year-end meetings as they were waiting for the Lord for the new year, something to happen, so they were praying and suddenly somebody said, why can't we bring the map of uh, Gujarat and Maharashtra? Because the Lord is uh, directing us to go there. And so the map was bought and then they tried to look at it. And one person said that I have a friend living in that place. I have an address. Uh, if you are interested to go, go to that place. And so they prayed and they collected, the church collected the offering and sent the leaders, about five of them went. And uh, as they went, it is about 18 hours by train and bus. So they started uh, a day and the next day afternoon, they reached the location. Uh, and what has happened was they have no clue. There's no one to welcome them uh, in, in that place. And then suddenly a person from behind calling them, asking them, are you from Rajasthan, uh, the state from where they started the journey? And they said, yes, how do you know? Um, you know, I've been waiting here for some time because in the night I had a dream uh, and that uh, five people from Rajasthan is coming and I heard a voice that you need to pick them and take them to your home. And that just, you know, uh, you know, gave a big surprise to these leaders. But what has happened was that was a divine movement uh, in which they started ministering in that location uh, and started preaching the gospel. And within a month's time, a lot of people came to the Lord through that initial ministry. Now that is about 30 years or so. Now it has gone so fast. But now in our annual convention, 
35 to 40,000 people gather in that location where the first convention happened. So I can, I can say that there is a, a bigger thing that we need to go for. We need prayer, we need to trust. Although things are difficult, sometimes patience, sometimes waiting, more would be good. But sometimes things are very hard. I have seen also my students going through hard times and then they have to move from that location to other locations. So uh, this is, you know, this is a wide spectrum. I think, thank you for asking that question because this is the reality of life. This is leadership. This is where God can come in and strengthen you in your work. And I pray that God will bring that uh, breakthrough into your situation. Mm. Thank you. An amazing story there, Finny, to hear of that, um, you know, that, that amazing answer to prayer and um, God speaking to that person in a dream. And yeah, let's pray for more of that, more, more Holy Spirit, more growth. Um, yeah, but I think it's true that, that leadership is often tough. I, I'm just going to quickly, um, someone called Amos from Uganda has just uh, asked, what are the five phases of leadership? So I'm going to just quickly say, you know, Amos, you need to get the book and Matt will tell you how to get the book. So that's the first thing, then you'll actually be able to read about them. But the first one is establish trust. The second one is to cultivate leaders. The third is to discern vision. The fourth is to implement plans, get started on some work. And the fifth is to transition out. So I'm sorry that's very speedy, but um, uh, Justin already went through it earlier on, but maybe you weren't um, able to join until after he'd explained. So I wanted to, for anybody who's joined late, explain that's what we've been talking about. We spent a bit of time talking about establishing trust. Um, and I think it would be really um, good to talk a bit about, we've spelt a bit about cultivating leaders as well, actually. Um, there is uh, another question on cultivating leaders from Matt. Um, he says, most ministries are full of firefighting. Obviously, cultivating leaders and a vision for the church is a key way to change this. But how can we help an already overly busy pastor invest time um, in this area, in cultivating other leaders when they're already far too busy? And I think this is um, a situation that many of you will recognise, because I'm sure many of you are pastors and uh, priests and vicars, whatever you call yourself, church leaders who are too busy. And um, I know myself, it's frankly much easier just to do it yourself than to ask someone else to do it, actually. So, Justin, how do you, how do you manage that? Well, another great question. I think don't try to do too much mentoring. If you've already got your hands really full, trying to sort of raise up 100 leaders or something is clearly going to be overwhelming. I do think it's striking how much time Jesus spent with 12 leaders. And he had the whole world to reach. So that's a, you know, obviously a huge a ministry. So what I'd want to say is just look out for one or two people who might be able to really share some of the load and realize that in the short term, it actually, frankly, it might make you busier. Spending time with one or two of these people on a weekly, fortnightly basis, even for half an hour or an hour. Yes, it's one extra thing. But if after a month or so you start to feel the benefit, well, uh, you're going to be glad that you spend the time doing that. So I do think the Lord, you know, obviously be praying, the Lord will bring people alongside you and then try to see who it is that maybe the Lord's bringing alongside and investing time with them. Uh, and it can be a pleasant time, you know, maybe again, it's meals, coffee times, you know, you need to be encouraged and refreshed and to find others who seem to be sharing that kind of excitement and you know, for the vision that you're beginning to discern, who want to be alongside you. Having time with those people, I think will energize you for the vast number of other things that are calling on your time, but will also help you to get them mentored, give them experience of leadership and help them develop as a leader themselves. Mm, Finney, and um, I'd really be interested in, in your thoughts on that, but also really about young leaders. And, 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 and now I'm really sorry, I'm not sure how to say your name, um, Mr. Mukherjee. Is it Sa Sayan Tan? You might be able to help me with that, Finney. Um, Sayan Tan's writing from India. He says, could you shed some light on leading teenagers? How can we lead young people who have a different set of interests? And I guess my thought on that is, well, you need young people to lead young people. So what are your thoughts on that, uh, Finney? Hi, Sayan Tan. Good that you are joined. Um, uh, when I came back from UK after my PhD, the thing that is that uh, since you have a PhD, all the leadership things should come on to your shoulder. So people thought that I have all the answers for the uh, things that are needed here in the ministry. But what God has put in my heart is that I have four areas which 
I really felt that God has called me in, which again itself is a big, uh, a big areas of work. So number one is developing leaders in the North Indian context, and the second one is to produce resources for the growing churches, mostly publishing, writing, and all those things. The second thing is uh, educating the children of the newer uh, churches or the, the, the believers of the newer churches. And the third uh, area, fourth area is uh, sustainability or development and economic upliftment. So these were the four areas, but again, it was too much for me to handle. But then what the Lord has done is that God has connected me divine with his divine providence to young people, smarter, um, under 30s, and but qualified and competent. But again, there are a lot of shaping to be done, but they all came into the scene. Uh, it took about five to six years for me to see that happening because it didn't happen that I could I could hire them but it, it's actually divinely provided because some discernment some uh, somebody connected me to some people who have a similar vision and giftedness so that brought me to a place where I could groom them together most of my days I spend morning hours in just saying hello to them, build them, understand the challenges. And then if they are too much uh, pressure, pray with them and leave them to do their job by themselves. Not to interfere, but press onto the vision and raise the bar. You know, I, I always emphasize the factor that, look, we need to be much more higher in our quality, a higher righteousness as Matthew would put uh, for his believers to work on. So that really helped. And so always whenever a younger person come to uh, uh, under my leadership, I always encourage them to raise their bar up and show them how to do that. I will always keep sure that, make sure that if I can't do myself what I'm telling others to do, don't ask others to do. So I always try my best to do it first and say that, look, fellow, um, I've done it. You can either copy it or uh, you know help uh, do it. So that's that's one way of uh, I'm doing it. I hope that answers the uh, the question. Mm, thank you. Um, that's really really great. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the tension between um, vision setting and then and getting implemented on plans. And there are a few questions here. There's one from Moses. Um, hi Moses, he, he asked about how can big picture leadership enhance my leadership effectiveness as a church pastor, um, which is great, big picture. But I'm also aware that actually um, sometimes it's easy to get stuck, isn't it, in the big picture and then you never actually quite get around to implementing. And in some places, this goes back to, I can't remember who it was now who asked about um, uh, Myers-Briggs and things but you know where, where people have really always got lots and lots of new ideas and then there are the people who are desperately trying to put the ideas into practice and get really discouraged because they never can quite keep up so I'd love just to talk about that tension and um, your experience of that Justin. Yeah um, again a great question so um, I found uh, one of the trustees when I was serving in, in the in the states in, in Pittsburgh uh, gave me a, a framework that I've used quite a lot since uh, he was saying you know in the sort of leadership world and in probably a wider world than that, some people are more inclined to the strategic level thinking, big picture ideas, uh, where we're going with a vision, all that kind of thing. They're very focused on that. Others are much more inclined to think, well, yes, but how do we do it? What am I supposed to do on Wednesday morning at three, you know, or three o'clock in the afternoon? How do I actually put this into practice? And I think one thing is to kind of be aware which direction you tend to lean. Are you more strategic, big picture, or are you more... Uh, focused on practice and how do you do it tactically. Um, so that's one thing. But also, I think the other thing is, as a leader, you need both. You absolutely need, I think, strategic thinking, big picture. How do we do this? Where are we going? But you also need, and frankly, lots of people who can put ideas into practice. So I think part of the leader's role is to recognise you really do need both. But it's also to help each group understand the other. And probably most of us, over the more strategic end. So number one, we better realize how much we need people who are really good at making things happen or our vision ain't gonna go anywhere. You know, <laughs> we need people who can actually make it happen or we're just winding people up with exciting <laughs> visions that are never going to happen. So on the one hand, we've got to, I think, recognize we really do need both. 
Um, but it is often the case, I think, of trying to explain to both of these kind of leanings, the strategic and the tactical, how important their role is. Everyone's got a part to play here. But on the one hand, you need people who can see where you're going, so there's an exciting sense of an adventure, and the people who can make it happen. And for both of those groups to see why they need the other group as well as themselves, I think that's one of the great creative tensions of the leader's life. That, that leads into another um, question. It's from, from William, um, who's actually told us he's already asked a question. He's writing from Nairobi, so it's good that we know that he's there in Kenya. Um, hi, William. Um, and he, he asks, are these phases of um, leadership linear or are they more cyclical? And I'd love your thoughts on that, Finney. Um, myself, I think they're probably uh, um, much more cyclical uh, because, or iterative actually, um, because you, you do, you know, you, you set vision, you achieve it, you review it, and then you might come around again. Um, so I, I'd love your thoughts on that, Finney. Is that your experience or do you think this, uh, the, the phases are more linear? Um, I, I totally agree with the concept of uh, more cyclical in the sense that it overlaps. I think that's a, that's a term that Justin has used in the book. There is an overlap of uh, these phases um, uh, in leadership. And so you cannot just say that I finished my first phase, second phase and third phase. Now I am in transition. Many years ago, I thought that I'll better build up uh, good transition plan for my leadership. And I started identifying people, started investing in their life. I've sent them for higher studies so that they will come back and uh, you know, take the leadership. I can start thinking about more research work, writing, creating resources for people. So that was my dream. But Lord had other plans. So when you think that it's time for transition, no, it's not your time for transition. There are other things to do. So there is that divine guidance all the time in terms of doing things. So um, we have to uh, see that overlap, uh, the trust being built only then the, uh, while you build your trust, the, the cultivation of leadership will all, uh, automatically happens. And then that trust is built on a, the bigger picture that you have, the vision that you have, and you cannot separate that. But sometimes it comes in phase, maybe the last phase, maybe a little later that emerges in your leadership. Mm. Folks, we've just got five minutes uh, left. How time has gone so quickly, it's been great. And I'm so sorry that we're not gonna be able to answer all the questions. Um, I've really appreciated you asking those and I've hardly used any of the ones that I've pre-prepared. So thank you for great questions, everyone. And um, let's think a little bit about transitioning out. Um, uh, Friday Amos is, um, is in Uganda and he says, in Africa, leaders do not want to leave leadership offices and this leads to mistrust. What do you advise? And there's also a really good question from Renata. Transitioning is a difficult phase to know when it's the right time. Which of these stages do you begin to train into leadership the Timothy who takes over? So just thinking, how, how, what's your advice for people thinking about transitioning? Um, just, just briefly, Justin. Well, I think, it, again, it, it is genuinely complicated. And I would say it, it is obviously important to be praying about these things. It's also important to have people around you who you can genuinely talk to about these things without the word getting out. You're thinking about stepping down because obviously that could be really significant for the ministry you're doing. So you need some perhaps mentor or, or someone who's your confidant, but someone who you will listen to um, because the, the point is you're there to serve them. They're not there to serve you. <laughs> and the danger is you get to the point you really quite enjoy leadership. I, I love leadership. So <laughs> Um, the danger is you start doing it because you like doing it. Well, I thought the idea was you're there because God sent you there, he gave you a job to do. Uh, and sometimes he takes you back out of it. I I'm kind of not overall leading anything at the moment. I'm helping another person who is the key leader. It's a different role. And so I'm you know, trying to go where you think God is calling you to go. And if people think, if I move out of this role, you know, that's kind of the end of me, end of my service. I just don't think that's true. It will be a different kind of service. And perhaps you might be mentoring others who are still in a leadership role. So I do think it's, it is a big deal, but have others around you who can help you discern that can be very helpful. Back to relationships again. Thank you, Justin. Um, just, we've just got the last uh, couple of minutes or so. Finney, what will you take from this conversation? What's really struck you? What, what's God been saying to you as we've talked together? 
I think this was a very um, motivational kind of uh, uh, conversation in the sense that it really helps me to think through and say, how can I now bring this to, to my own context? How can I uh, develop these concepts into our leadership development programs? One of the challenges, like in many of the churches in the global south, we face particularly the third movement, which I call that the independent churches that are emerging. And this is the larger uh, growth factor. Well, this is where the growth is happening. And here we have great leaders. People have pioneering spirit. They have led to the growth. Now we have come to a second generation, which doesn't have the same value of that uh, of the fathers or those who are founded um, ministry. Some of them move into a, a sacred celebrity culture or sometimes nepotism is em em emerging into the context. And I believe that this um, book and particularly the concept that's been elaborated for us in terms of life cycle, which will really give a real focus on what to actually put our efforts in. I believe that in that sense, this is a valuable resource for the global church. And I personally want to utilize this as a textbook for our leadership development program. Thank you, Finney. Justin, the, the last word to you. Thank you for writing the book. What will you take from our conversation this afternoon, this morning, wherever you are, this evening? Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. It's this afternoon for Justin and me. <laughs> Well, I, I must say, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Delighted to hear people from all around the world joining in. And that's been very heartwarming to me. And I want to you know, pay tribute to Langham Publishing for having this sort of more international vision. And not only are they doing a reduced offer on the book, it's free international shipping anywhere in the world. Well, that's an amazing deal. So don't miss the chance. Don't miss the chance. But do keep the big picture leadership in front of you. Know that there is a kind of typical journey and kind of know what lies ahead and know what you might be in the middle of and just to keep praying and trusting that God's going to lead you through. Oh, thank you both. I've really enjoyed our conversation. And uh, for me, I'm going to take uh, really the, just the, the importance of doing it with God, actually. Um, whether we're working in Christian organisations or like me, I'm working out um, in a secular setting, actually leading with God is, um, is, is the way that we need to do that. And thank you so much for your wisdom and your great examples. Um, thank you everyone for joining. And I uh, wish you a really uh, blessed rest of the day. And um, thank you. <laughs>